Hello and welcome to today's Peter Town Hall meeting with Peter President Ingrid Newkirk, Peter's Vice President for Regulatory Testing Jessica Sandler, and Cathy Guillermo, our Senior Vice President for Laboratory Investigations. I am Ben Williamson, Peter's Senior International Media Director, and I'll be co-hosting today's Town Hall. This meeting will be focused almost entirely on Peter's landmark work to end cruel experiments and training exercises on animals. Ingrid, Jessica, and Kathy will be on the line shortly to give you a behind-the-scenes look at how Peter scientists and researchers, with the help of your generous supporters, are stopping deadly and painful experiments on animals, also promoting the development and adoption of innovative new non-animal testing methods and winning significant victories that are getting animals out of laboratory cages. All three will be here answering your questions about this critically important part of Peter's work for animals later in today's meeting. If you have access to a computer, you can stream this meeting through your web browser at peter.org slash October Town Hall. Once you've logged in, you can watch the slides that will give you additional background on the work that we'll be discussing today, as well as type in your questions and listen to the Town Hall without using your phone. For those of you on the phone, at any time during tonight's town hall, you can simply press zero to ask a question. You'll then speak with a PETA staff member who will record your question and put you back into the call so you can listen in until it's time to ask your question live. Our town hall meetings, as always, they generate a high volume of questions. And while we may not get to everyone on today's call, please rest assured that we will follow up and answer every question we can't get to live after the meeting ends. This special town hall meeting is coming to you during Peter's Animals Out of the Labs Challenge, and every donation we receive today will be matched dollar for dollar, meaning it will have twice the impact on the work we'll be discussing. To have your gift matched during the call, just press 7 at any time. You can take advantage of this matching gift challenge by going to peter.org slash match and giving online. For those of you who are just joining today's Peter Town Hall, my name is Ben Williamson, and I am Peter's Senior International Media Director. And I'm responsible for placing worldwide media exclusives for all of Peter's vital work. I'll be helping to host this live event with Ingrid Newkirk, Jessica Sandler, and Kathy Guillermo. And don't forget, throughout the call, press zero to ask a question, or press seven to make a gift that will be matched today. And now I'll turn it over to Ingrid. Thank you, Ben. And hello, everyone. I'm very glad everyone on the line could join us today. This is our fifth town hall meeting of 2016. And if you haven't attended one of our town halls before, then welcome. And if you have, welcome back. I'm pretty sure everyone on the call is going to come away from today's meeting really assured, convinced of how critically important the work that Peter is accomplishing for animals in laboratories is. As Ben mentioned, uh, today we're going to talk about a topic that goes way back to Peter's very beginnings. This is the work we do to stop cruel experiments on animals and to replace them with modern, cruelty-free research methods that keep dogs and rats and monkeys and mice and all the other animals safe and away from ever being subjected to the pain and the fear that we all know they experience in laboratories. Um, today, we have some breaking news, which makes me very angry and also very glad at the same time. So it's a little conflicting but I'm going to save that um, for last. So meanwhile, let me take you down memory lane. Um, I think many of you probably know about our 1981 Silver Spring Monkeys case, which was Peter's very first eyewitness investigation. It was a case that was on the front page of the Washington Post several times, and it sparked what became a global anti-vivisection movement. It was a groundbreaking case, and it led to the first ever cutoff of an NIH grant to experimenters, also the first arrest and the first criminal conviction of an animal experimenter for cruelty to animals. That really shook people up. It was also the very first confiscation of abused animals from a laboratory, 
And I still remember those monkeys being taken outside and feeling the sun for the very first time since they had been captured in the Philippines. And this case, the Silver Spring Monkeys case, was also the very first U.S. Supreme Court victory for animals used in experiments. But perhaps as important than all those many firsts is the conversation that that case helped us touch off. What happened, people couldn't believe it when they saw it on, I think it was the NBC Nightly News. And people from across the United States and, and in, really across the world, all sorts of countries, saw for the first time that animals could be helped if they were in labs. There was something people could do. And for the first time, everyone was talking about the horrors of animal experimentation. And for the first time, they thought, maybe we can stop these things. Maybe we can get more animals out of those cages. Believe it or not, before that case, you could only buy one shampoo. It was Nature de France uh, that wasn't tested on animals. And cruelty-free, those words, magic words, weren't on any labels that you would find on products, not anywhere, unless you went to your local co-op, perhaps took your own bottle and stuck your own label on. And today we've come a long way. And I always want to remember that because it helps to look back as you're looking forward and get encouraged. Today, we have more than 2,000 companies in our PETA database who have sworn off all animal tests for their products. And you'll find our logo, Beauty Without Bunnies, the cruelty-free logo, on countless products on the shelves of stores, even like Target and Walmart. So for years, it seemed... The only way some companies would listen to us as animal rights activists was when we were protesting outside their front doors, even cementing ourselves into shoes in their driveway so they couldn't move us. But now multinational camp companies are, are coming to us. They, they knock on our door. They're asking our experts for help. Uh, so that they can implement non-animal testing methods. They know they have to. And they come to us when they're looking for advice on cruelty-free ways to avoid these deadly, outdated, regulatory animal testing requirements, the old laws that they have to abide by. So today, PETA is the only animal group that works on all areas of animal experimentation. That means from the university laboratory to the testing facilities of Fortune 100 chemical companies. We've closed laboratories. We've ended studies like that hideous U.S. government maternal deprivation study in which, as you know, they took the babies away from their mothers at birth or shortly afterwards, and they tormented them with fake snakes and men in masks and all sorts of mechanical things and noises so that these babies became mentally ill. We stopped the terrible cat experiments at the University of Wisconsin. You remember double trouble, perhaps? And we stopped the horribly abusive dog and cat laboratory in North Carolina, PRLS, which was shut down totally. And all the dogs and cats from there we got placed in homes. They came out of those cages. Now, in some countries, uh, although we stopped the import of Mexican dogs into the U.S. Uh, for one of those UCLA labs, but still, in some countries, stray dogs are still being dragged out of these alleyways and off the road so that they can be cut open and killed in mostly surgical trauma training courses. And the reason these hideously cruel training methods are still used is often just because the facilities that use them lack the financial resources. It's not that they're unwilling to switch to these sophisticated, lifelike human patient simulators, these fancy things that have become standard in the U.S. They just can't afford it. But thanks to a PETA program many of you know about, we're now up to 19 countries that have ended the use of animals for trauma surgery training. Each of them has switched to state-of-the-art simulators 
that are donated by Peter. These things look like human beings. They bleed like human beings. They're phenomenal. Um, we also continue to expose China's animal testing requirements for cosmetics. This is unforgivable that that country requires such things. And what we've done is fund the very first training for Chinese scientists on these state-of-the-art non-animal tests. So I won't talk more, as I could, about all the progress we have made for animals. It's completely tremendous. Um, in the decades since the Silver Spring Monkey case, many, many things have changed. But please know this. For us at PETA, the bottom line is that not only do we expose cruelty in laboratories and training exercises, that's not enough. We end it. Indeed, and that's exactly what seems to be on the verge of happening in the Netherlands right now. I'm sure many of you have heard about the historic decision by the Dutch government that has made the Netherlands the first country in the world to begin phasing out all experiments on animals. Their newly announced goal is to replace these terribly crude and cruel experiments with human relevant animal-free testing methods by 2025. Yes, when, when we first got wind of this, I can't remember being that excited about a victory, and I'm excited about many, but being that excited about one um, since um, we got the news that fox hunting was being stopped in the UK, something that I also didn't know I would live to see. Um, this Dutch news is terrific news for about half a million animals who are in cages suffering in Dutch laboratories. It's also a really tremendous validation of the work being done by gifted PETA scientists, not only in the U.S., but also in Europe, who are now making the use of innovative non-animal research methods the standard in laboratories. So we're hopeful that this news will compel regulators. We're convinced at some point it will compel regulators and other governments of other nations in the world to ignore the tired old excuses from experimenters that still say things like, oh, it's always been done that way. They, they just need to stop seeing animals as test tube with whiskers, and they need to use this animal research, that ha this non-animal research, that uh, is what the Dutch government is now embracing. So Kathy and Jesse are going to talk more about this landmark news from Holland in a, in a little bit. Um, and they have some very interesting insights. They know the history of how this happened. But before we bring them in, please remember, this is vital, at any time you can press zero on your phone and ask a question about any aspect of Peter's work and how you can make a difference for animals. And you can press seven, and, and please do press seven to make a donation, a gift that's going to be matched a dollar for dollar today. That's really important for our continuation, our strengths, our efficiency, and our effectiveness. If you're joining us online, you can ask your question directly through that question field on your screen. And please stay on the line throughout the presentation today because we will be answering questions a little bit later in the evening. And a reminder, every single gift made today up to $500,000, that's our goal, is going to be doubled through Peter's Out of the Labs Matching Gift Challenge. To make a gift that will do twice as much to keep animals from being burned and mutilated and poisoned and killed and what have you, just press 7 on your phone at any time. And thanks to um, people who have actually uh, already responded to the call. You've risen to the occasion and made a gift. I'm being handed something now that says, we already know Julie from Florida. $150. Thank you. Eileen from Connecticut, $50. George from Nova Scotia, $50. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, Eileen, and George. Thank you, everyone who's pressing seven. Um, for those of you who don't know, every year we spend into the millions of dollars, and it's all worth it, millions of dollars, investigating and exposing cruel experiments on animals and providing advice and providing pressure to get those animals out. 
So your support is, is deeply appreciated and it's vital. Um, so again, that's just seven or peter.org slash match. And let me now introduce someone who many of you have met before. This is a longtime colleague for a little more than 27 years. Peter's Senior Vice President of Laboratory Investigations, Kathy Guillermo. She wrote the powerful book about that Silver Spring Monkeys investigation. It's called Monkey Business, and it spotlighted how important that case was to the entire animal rights movement. Kathy um, was lost on a town hall in August. She spoke about our groundbreaking work for horses, and a bit later, we're going to discuss an extraordinary new Peter India investigation into facilities where horses, donkeys, and mules are being abused and neglected to produce antitoxins. But that's later. Today, at this moment, she's going to be talking about that epic Dutch decision to phase out all experiments on animals. Huge victory for her team and all the caring Peter supporters who were able to help us accomplish this a few days ago. So, Kathy, over to you. Thank you, Ingrid. And I have one fantastic victory to share with you first. Ingrid just told you of a few of the many victories for animals that PETA scientists and researchers have helped make possible in recent years, thanks to your support. And late last week, we learned of another victory that has been at least seven years in the making, but it really seemed to happen almost literally overnight. This goes back to 2009 when PETA first exposed the use of animals for sales training exercises conducted by Johnson & Johnson. And you know J&J, the multi-billion dollar corporation that manufactures consumer products under brands like Band-Aid, Listerine, and Neutrogena, as well as medical equipment. The company has labeled itself the world's most comprehensive medical devices business. So you can imagine how many animals have suffered horribly in these cruel training drills to help sell equipment that's used by doctors and hospitals. During these trainings that I'm talking about now, pigs were cut open and they were killed in order to show sales personnel how products work, even though this practice has already been abandoned by many of Johnson & Johnson's top competitors. So instead of mutilating and killing live animals to demonstrate how a surgical medical device works in human beings, many of these other major companies no longer use animals for this purpose at all. Instead, they rely on superior non-animal methods, such as advanced human patient simulators, living human cadaver models, or synthetic soft tissue models. For years, PETA conducted protests, and we held many behind-the-scenes negotiations with the company in the hope of ending these stupid and deadly drills. And in 2012, a PETA representative, Dr. Alka Chenna, spoke before Johnson & Johnson's annual shareholder meeting and called on the company to follow its own animal welfare guidelines and stop cutting up healthy animals when cruelty-free methods are so readily available. Outside that meeting, we had PETA protesters in pig outfits who were handing out leaflets, and they were catching the attention of shareholders, but the company wouldn't budge. Just recently, we learned that the company was planning to conduct another training using pigs. It was scheduled to be in Cincinnati tomorrow, October 27th, and we knew we had to act very quickly to keep more animals from going under the knife. So last Wednesday, we posted an action alert on PETA.org calling on J&J &J to immediately stop using animals in deadly training drills for sales representatives. Within hours of sending an email about the alert and posting it to PETA social media channels, more than 12,000 kind PETA supporters, many of you on this call today, I'm guessing, had taken action. That one alert really paid off. Less than 24 hours after we posted it, Johnson & Johnson banned the use of animals in sales training across North America. And they said they would stop the use of animals for such trainings across the entire globe by the end of 2016. From the medical sales trainings conducted by companies like Johnson & Johnson to the surgical trauma courses that Ingrid mentioned a few minutes ago, more medical professionals than ever are realizing that state-of-the-art 
non-animal training tools are the most effective way to ensure their proficiency without harming animals. And Pete is at the forefront of making that change happen, thanks to your help. Thank you, Kathy. And yes, uh, before we talk more about that milestone news from the Netherlands, as Kathy points out, None of the progress that you've heard about today would be possible without the support of kind people like you who share Peter's commitment to stopping horrific experiments on animals. And I do hope that you'll help us continue this vital work by pressing 7 on your phone right now. So it's 0 to ask a question and 7 to make a generous donation that will be matched dollar for dollar today. Um, ben, let me interrupt you. I have some lovely news from our members. Arthur from Naples, Florida, just gave us $100 towards this program. Um, Joanne from Pueblo, uh, Colorado, $150. Gloria from Johnstown, Colorado. What's the Colorado stuff doing here? $75. Carol from Philadelphia, giving Colorado a run for its money, $125. You're all fantastic. Thank you so, so much. John of Uniontown, Pennsylvania, $50. Francis of Fresh Meadows, New York, $300 goes into the kitty so that we can help animals. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'll be looking forward to hearing from many more of you before this meeting is over. So please, as Ben said, just press 7 on your phone if you'd like to support our work. Now, or go to peter.org stroke match and make a gift to keep the work going. And don't forget those questions. You just press zero to speak to a PETA representative, and you'll be right back in the town hall so you won't miss a thing. Let me introduce you now to another person at the forefront of PETA's work to get animals out of laboratories. She's Vice President for Regulatory Testing, Jessica Sandler. She and Kathy are going to discuss how Peter's work helped make that historic decision in the Netherlands a reality. And they'll give you details on what Peter is doing to see that other countries will eventually follow their lead. Jessica, over to you. Thank you, Ingrid. So as you heard a bit earlier, Holland's goal is to replace experiments on animals with human-relevant, non-animal testing methods by 2025. That means that if it goes as planned, in little more than eight years, animals will no longer be poisoned, burned, sliced into, or killed in Dutch laboratories. That Dutch announcement probably came as a surprise to many in the animal experimentation industry, and maybe even to those in the animal rights community. But for me and others in PETA's regulatory testing department, it's a milestone that comes after many years of pushing for the use of effective research methods that don't use animals. The science behind some of what we've helped accomplish in Holland can seem a bit daunting, so I'll give you just a few details to help fill in the gaps on why this news is such a game changer. I should probably start by explaining that at PETA, mostly for strategic reasons, we divide the world of animal experimentation into two different sorts of experiments, those that are required to be conducted by law and those that are not required to be conducted. When Holland came to us for assistance, they requested help with both types of these experiments. So examples of non-required testing include medical research, university research, and curiosity research, like let's sew this kitten's eyes shut, let's rotate, her in, let's rotate her in a drum and drop her into a vat of water, and then we'll say that there is a connection to a sudden infant death syndrome. Or let's use dogs to study erectile dysfunction in humans. Both of these are real examples, by the way. The answer to many of these types of experiments is for us to force the experimenters or the sponsors providing the funding to just end them. But then there are all the tests that government regulatory agencies require be conducted, and that could be here in the US or anywhere overseas. But here at home, we have the uh, Environmental Protection Agency that requires testing on industrial chemicals and pesticides. And we have the Food and Drug Administration that requires testing on drugs, vaccines, and medical devices. 
These required tests have to be replaced with, ve with specific non-animal methods. And that, of course, is where PETA's regulatory testing department comes in. No animal organization puts as much hard science into replacing these types of tests. Our work to end these experiments is now enhanced by the PETA International Science Consortium, which we incorporated in 2012 to coordinate the scientific and regulatory expertise of PETA US and all of our international affiliates. The consortium champions the development and implementation of the best non-animal non research methods, obviously with the goal of completely eliminating animal experiments. So in a little bit, I'll talk more about how PETA and the PETA Science Consortium are keeping animals from suffering in deadly experiments. But first, we're gonna go back to Kathy, and she is going to share with you more details on how we helped make that momentous announcement by the Netherlands possible. Thanks, Jesse. We established a working relationship with Dutch officials long before this current amazing plan was announced. Last summer, one of the Dutch political parties called for a phase out of experiments on primates, on monkeys in, Nether in the Netherlands. Pete in Netherlands, contacted the members of parliament that were behind that effort, and they learned that the two other political parties that opposed this effort, there were two other political parties that were opposed to this effort. So we decided to show them all why it was important. We gathered support from across Europe, and before the vote on primate experiments, Pete and Netherlands delivered a petition signed by more than 100,000 caring people to the Dutch parliament. This persuaded all the parties that this issue was important, and we were invited to the negotiating table with everyone involved. And this is where we made our scientific case. The measure was passed, and a whole new era began. Europe's largest primate laboratory, the Biomedical Primate Research Center, a really hideous facility in the Netherlands that imprisons more than 1,300 monkeys, was told to phase out experiments and shut down. The impact of our input on the primate measure meant that PETA had earned the right to stay at the table in further discussions on replacing all animal experimenters. And so PETA was invited by the Dutch government to help design a strategy with the goal of phasing out animal experiments in the Netherlands by 2025. In September, two PETA scientists took part in a special meeting to help with that goal. And PETA was the only international animal group at this meeting. And following that, our scientists in the UK and the US compiled a 70-page document identifying 25 areas of animal experimentation that can be ended immediately or very soon, as well as a strategy for phasing out all animal use. Our evidence made a powerful case that continued experiments would not only cause tremendous animal suffering, but would actually impede progress in addressing cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and other serious health concerns. We know that PETA's role, our role in this process, pushed the Dutch government to announce its goal of phasing out all animal experiments in just a little more than eight years. And we believe that when implemented, it will serve as a powerful example to Europe and to other countries around the world, and millions fewer fewer animals will be poisoned and killed in laboratories as a result. Thank you, Kathy. And while the news coming out of the Netherlands is certainly a milestone, 2016 is looking like it will be a landmark year in all of our work to stop deadly experiments on animals. But before Jessica tells us more about why, uh, I just want to remind you uh, that you can press zero at any time today to ask a question. This is really an exciting bit. It's your opportunity to say what's on your mind, to ask a question about any of the complicated stuff that Jesse and Kathy have been talking about tonight. So we really do want to hear from you. And I hope, of course, that you'll consider pressing seven and making a gift that will be matched during today's town hall. Jessica, over to you. Thank you, Ben. So I mentioned uh, the PETA International Science Consortium, but I'll give you a little more information on that uh, at this point. This is a team of currently 18 scientists who are spread across three continents that is changing the face of regulatory testing. We are funding non-animal methods. We are conducting in-person training sessions for scientists and regulators. We are publishing papers in respected scholarly journals. 
we are presenting our work at international scientific conferences. And, um, oh, yeah, we're also briefing members of Congress. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we were on Capitol Hill showcasing animal-free research laboratories whose sophisticated work can replace animal use. And I'll give you just a few other examples of very recent work. We have a nanotoxicology expert who is leading an international project to develop non-animal tests that can be used to predict human lung reactions to nanomaterials and other substances. And we had more than 500 participants from all over the globe in our recent webinar series on animal-free methods to determine the hazards of inhaled substances, including chemicals, pesticides, and tobacco. Our work is now a recognized and vital part of the global scientific community. In fact, Dr. Klippinger, who is the Associate Director of the PETA Science Consortium and the Director of the Regulatory Testing Department, now serves as President of the In Vitro and Alternative Methods Specialty Section of the International Society of Toxicology. She is the first person from an animal rights background to ever hold such a position. And I might add, she was actually voted into that position by its members. This past year, our scientists convinced the Canadian government to end deadly year-long experiments in which dogs are forced to eat pesticide-laced food or to inhale pesticide fumes every day for a full year before being killed and dissected. We were also successful in getting the U.S. government. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can hear so that sorry. lovely dog. That dog is applauding this work. <laughs> so sorry. Um, we also were successful in getting the U.S. government, which, which we had already gotten to end those same year-long tests, to take more concrete steps to dramatically reduce the number of animals required to be used in pesticide testing here. With help from our scientists, PETA India convinced that country to stop requiring that drugs be retested on animals after they had already been tested and approved in other countries. This single change will save tens of thousands of animals every year. And I'm sure you are all familiar with the images of the horrific Dray's tests in which rabbits are restrained as chemicals are dripped into their eyes or smeared onto their sensitive skin without pain relief. Late this summer, we were also able to convince the Indian government to accept the use of non-animal methods to replace the use of rabbits in those hideous tests. Back here at home, after years of work by PETA scientists, this past spring, President Obama, you probably heard, signed into law the Frank Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act. This is a vital piece of legislation that is going to modernize how chemicals are tested in the U.S. and end many painful and ineffective tests that would otherwise have killed tens of thousands of animals. And just in September, we had another great win for animals that came after we submitted detailed comments to a Food and Drug Administration proposal that would require thousands of animals to be used to test the ingredients in antibacterial soaps. These are the products that you buy in the supermarket to kill germs either on your hands or on your kitchen counters. The Food and Drug Administration agreed that these products are neither safe nor effective, that you might as well just use soap and water, and as a result, as many as 9,000 animals will now not be used to test these substances. Anyone listening who wants to learn more about the PETA Science Consortium uh, can visit the website at PISCLTD.org. Dot UK, or even more simply, just Google the PETA International Science Consortium, and it will come up. There is a brief video on the front page of the website that you can watch, and it breaks down how we're making such a powerful difference for animals in laboratories. Thank you, Jesse, for sharing that wonderful news, so much wonderful news there. 
And I'm sure that learning about Peter's role in that great development in the Netherlands, and indeed the many other ways that Jessica and Kathy's teams are getting animals out of laboratories, has prompted more than a few questions among you. But one final reminder, please press zero to ask your questions. This is the last call for questions. Press zero to ask a question, and we'll get to them live in a few minutes. And now Jessica is going to tell us about a new Indian investigation into the suffering of horses for the production of antitoxins. Jessica. Okay. Well, uh, for me to talk about this, everyone needs to bear with me for just a moment. There's going to be just a tiny bit of science now, but I promise it will be over very quickly. Antitoxins, we need to understand antitoxins. They are the substances that our bodies make to defend us from toxins. All animals' bodies produce antitoxins, not just humans. Nearly every one of the 200 or so antitoxins being sold by pharmaceutical companies today to treat everything from botulism to snake bites comes from horses, mules, and donkeys. And here's how they do it. The animals are injected with a toxin and after their immune system reacts and responds to the toxin, as much as 10 liters of their blood is drained through a very large needle that is jabbed into a neck vein. And just to give you some idea, for a horse, that is about 15% of the horse's total blood. This painful process is repeated over and over again, sometimes as often as every two weeks for most of the animal's lives. It is not uncommon for the animals who endure this misery to suffer from painful complications and even die. So, of course, we are working towards the development of non-animal methods of antitoxin production that will spare horses and other animals from this suffering. The PETA International Science Consortium published a scientific paper on this topic just last year, and we'll have more news on this work very soon. But as a recent investigation has revealed, the pain that these animals go, go through goes well beyond being repeatedly injected with toxins and then bled. Almost all of the companies that sell antitoxins rely on facilities in developing countries where the laws for animals used in medical experiments are either non-existent or poorly monitored and, and mostly not enforced. And that seems to be exactly what has happened in India, where experts from PETA India and prominent Indian veterinary colleges visited 10 facilities and discovered widespread suffering and neglect among thousands of horses, donkeys, and mules who are being used as living factories to produce these antitoxins. Most of the facilities they inspected were not even registered with the Indian government authority that is supposed to be responsible for authorizing such procedures on animals. What those inspectors documented during their site visits was the stuff of nightmares. Horses with, dece with diseased hooves, malnourished, they had infections, parasites, swollen limbs, they were lame, they had eye problems, these were all common, and even basics like dental care and hoof trimming were ignored. Animals at these facilities were typically kept in crowded, barren enclosures where many were forced to stand and lie in their own waste, and some suffered from something called capped elbow, which is a painful swelling of the joints caused by lying on hard floors. When it came time to collect blood for the antitoxins, many of the facilities used painfully large needles, if you can imagine, larger even than the large needles that are allowed, and they did this in order to gather the blood more quickly. Since news of this investigation broke a few weeks ago, more than 50,000 PDUS supporters have contacted the Indian government and called on them to immediately revoke the licenses of these terrible facilities and to encourage companies to use non-animal methods of antitoxin production. If you haven't yet had a chance to join the thousands who have responded to the action alert on this issue, you can visit PETA.org forward slash India Horses and you can watch the video that was captured during PETA India's investigation and then take action. 
Thank you, Jesse. Uh, that investigation, I must say, is very, very deeply upsetting, not only to anyone who cares about horses, but absolutely anyone who has a heart. And the photographs will just upset you beyond belief. So the important thing is just to take, take action. Um, I've heard from many of our supporters in recent weeks about the misery Peter India found in these places. People have had a peak. And now what we need to do is everything we possibly can to pressure the Indian government to stop the suffering of these horses, donkeys, and mules while we uh, work on getting alternatives to their use. But first, I just want to say I love our members, I love our supporters, and you're absolutely fantastic. Patricia, Colorado Springs. It's Colorado night. $50. Thank you so much. David Rubin, always a treat to hear from you and supporting our work so marvelously. $2,000, thank you. Nancy Longboat Key, Florida, $100, you're marvelous. Michael University, Florida, uh, University Park, Florida, I think that is, $100, absolutely wonderful. Keep the fires burning here against animal use. Uh, Lawson and Helen, $100. I don't know where you're from, but wherever you're from, you're a great supporter, uh, both two of you great supporters. Donna from California, thank you so much, $200. Joan, Franklin Square, $50. Not sure where that is. I think it's New York. Phyllis, Palm Desert, $100. Thank you, thank you. Jennifer of Wisconsin, that's Jennifer of Wisconsin, $300. You're an angel. Gary of Texas, $100. We cannot do the work without you. And Joy, it's your birthday today. And for your birthday, you're giving us a present of $500 to help stop animal experiments. Happy birthday, Joy, and thank you. And my beautiful Violetta and Charles of New York, $1,000. Thank you all very, very much. You're just tremendous. And now, I'm going to tell you about that breaking news that I mentioned before when we began, and um, you'll understand why it's, it's very hurtful and also very good news, too. Um, at last, and this comes after several years of trying extremely hard to move a government agency that's like a brick wall, we have successfully pressured the U.S. Department of Agriculture to take serious action, serious action, against one of the world's biggest abusers of monkeys. This is a lab, some of you may know it, it's called SNBL. It's a Japanese primate testing corporation, but it operates out of Washington State and um, Texas. And because of our complaints about deaths of monkeys in horrible ways. They didn't just pass out in their sleep. Um, the USDA finally launched an investigation. They called in the Investigative Enforcement Service, and they have taken action. What they have done is they have just filed a lawsuit. This is a very big deal for USDA to file a lawsuit. They filed a lawsuit against, against SNBL. And they cite multiple violations of the Animal Welfare Act. They show in their complaint that monkeys indeed died very badly. One baby monkey tried to escape through a fence. I don't know escape from what, but it couldn't have been good. And the monkeys on the other side saw this little fellow trying to get away and tried desperately to pull this baby through to them, but he was stuck. And, of course, no staff paid any attention. They didn't notice until it was too late to save him, and he died. Other monkeys died of organ failure. This is so totally inexcusable. They came on flights from Cambodia and apparently had no water and no food, and their organs just collapsed. You can see more about this, and I don't say this to torture you, but to pass it on to other people who need to hear about this. If you go to peter.org, and, and there is also a video there that we released in 2011 from inside that hideous place. So now you know, I had those mixed emotions, and now you know how tenacious 
if you didn't already, and most of you did, how tenacious we have to be to get things accomplished. But finally, those wheels are turning for that, that horrible place. So we've covered a lot today, but please remember, none, I say this every time, and it's as true every time as it is now, none of the tremendous progress you've heard about would be possible without the support of people who believe, as we do, that animals are not ours to experiment on. They're living beings with feelings like ours, and they deserve to be left out of the experimentation equation. With each victory, we are that much closer to that day, which may be far in the future because the mountain is so high to climb, but we're closer to that day when every cage will be empty and when experimenters will use only non-animal methods that are truly life-saving for both animals and human beings, and when animals are afforded the simple right not to be cut into and poisoned and maimed and killed, chopped up in the name of science, the bogus name of science often. So I do hope you'll help us. Uh, you do. You're wonderful to us. And I hope that you know you're part of everything we do and you'll help us continue this work. Um, if you haven't already, please, please um, press 7 on your phone right now. And for those of you following online, just go to peter.org uh, slash match and every single generous gift you make uh, up to our $500,000 goal. And that really is is money we have to have to get into these labs, to go to these conferences, to make these papers, to buy these simulators, to do all the science that we do. We give grants to people to come up with alternatives to animal experiments. Every one of your gifts will be matched dollar for dollar, and all of it will go to help get animals out of the labs. So I know you have many questions, and we're running out of time. Um, so we should get to them. Ben, will you help us with that, please? Yes, thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, Manuela has been waiting very patiently on the line from New York. Uh, Man Dr. Manuela, are you there? What's your question? Yes, I'm here. Go Hi, ahead, please. Um, this is Manuela. I'm a scientist, um, and I work on modeling and simulation. Um, however, that's not so important. I think what I am, um, I would like to point out here is that I'm really happy to hear that you have this uh, science uh, consortium in place uh, because um, getting the scientists on board, I think, is absolutely essential in order to change the culture and change thinking about animal testing. Um, so uh, getting more scientists uh, uh, participating into this consortium is key. And I would like to advocate that CETA participate into conferences, but also uh, into major conferences organized by professional societies, because that's where most of the scientists convenes, and that's where you can really, um, um, you know, uh, touch base with the majority of, of us. And uh, I think that's important. And I would like just to make a comment about that, and uh, you know, see your reaction about it. Dr. Manuela, thank you so much for that. That's, that's wonderful. If you have specific professional conferences where you think that our presence would be of use, and as you know, there are hundreds of them, please let us know what those specific ones are, and you can get back on the call afterwards and do that or just email us at any time. Um, but I'll ask Jesse because it's the Peter uh, International Science Consortium that attends a lot of these conferences, to just um, mention how many scientists we have on our team, let alone on the outside, and, and what conferences you have found useful. Okay, thank you. Well, I think I mentioned right now we have 18 scientists around the world, uh, and we're looking to hire more. If anyone knows of any qualified scientists for this area, please get in touch. Um, and many of those scientists are PhDs, and it's, a, it's just a fact that when you walk into a conference or a meeting and you have a PhD behind your name, you are automatically listened to uh, with greater respect. So we've made an effort to really get very, very, very qualified people um, that we can hire. Uh, we go to conferences constantly, Manuela. 
Um, with, there, I have people who travel constantly. Uh, so we are at toxicology conferences. We are at pharmacology conferences. We are all over the place. Uh, we are at nanotoxicology conferences, and this is not just in the U.S. Um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which oversees a lot of the testing guidelines that are implemented worldwide, are based in Europe. So we are in the Scandinavian countries a lot. We are in Europe, European countries. So yes, like Ingrid said, just send us any additional suggestions you have. And if it's not one that's already on our list, we will definitely look into it. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Manuel, for your question. Uh, we have another caller on the line, hopefully. Gabrielle in Martinsdale, New Jersey. Gabrielle, are you there? Yes, hi. Yes, hi. This is Gabrielle. Um, hi. My question is, um, is the protection from medical research also applying to small lab animals uh, for both no. FDA and EPA-approved research? And I'm talking about, you know, small animals. Um, such as my the rodents, which um, they are used for laboratory research by the thousands. Yes, I, I know. Thank you, Gabrielle. A wonderful question. I'm going to pass it to Kathy in a second. Just to say, we have a video on our site. It's called Who Cares About Mice and Rats? We Do. And that's a big part of our work is to get people to recognize that it doesn't matter how small they are. They share the same physiology as larger animals. They have this much feeling and sensitivity to pain and fear. So I'm going to pass this to Kathy and have her tell you what we're doing. But unfortunately, under law, as, uh, as you probably know, uh, the Animal Welfare Act okay. does not cover them or recognize them as animals at all. So, Kathy, off to you. Right, and I, I think it's important to, to note that under the Animal Welfare Act, mice and rats are not even defined as animals, uh, which is, you know, obviously not true. There was a study out just this week showing that mice can actually feel the pain of other mice. They're not so different from us in that way. How they are different is that they're not like human beings at all physiologically. And so many of the studies that are done on mice don't work or don't translate to human beings. And we are constantly objecting to and working to end those studies because they're simply bad science. And there is a little bit of protection that is offered to mice under the National Institutes of Health, the, the Public Health Service guidelines. It's very difficult to get NIH to enforce those rules, uh, but we constantly expose what's going on and file complaints so that those can be investigated. And when we see that bad science is occurring, we object to that and in some cases have had uh, results that were obviously inapplicable to people told. Yeah, we have stopped experiments, Gabrielle, just to let you know. Tough road to hoe, but there we are. Thank you very much for your question, Gabrielle. Um, we next have an online question from Michelle from St. Louis. Uh, who said, I've seen a few emails from PETA and PCRM, that's the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, saying that the U.S. medical schools had stopped using animals, but then I read about experiments at some of the same universities. Can one of you please elaborate on the difference for me? Kathy, maybe you can take this one from Michelle. Sure. There are different sides to universities. The animals who used to be used in the medical training exercises were mostly used by medical students who were going through the medical course to get their uh, medical degree. The experimentation side is entirely different. It is the science departments at the university. Many of them receive grants from our government to support what they do. And and that is the kind of experiments that Jess was talking about earlier, the curiosity-based experiments largely. It, it's a very separate division uh, from what is being done in the medical schools. Now, we have non-animal methods that can replace animals in those medical trainings. Much of the curiosity research done by universities is, is just garbage, and that's what we need to prove and stop and have done so. Uh, for example, with a double trouble the cat studies that were done at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, just a, a one little thing, Ben. I just, I'm receiving some emails as we're on this call. 
Janet Mills from California. That was my out of office that said, hang on. <laughs> I'm not here. I am here. And I thank you so much for um, making a donation. Uh, sending it is fine. Um, but please let me thank some other people too, in addition to lovely Janet. There's Teresa from Quebec. Uh, $250, thank you so much. Joe from Columbus, Ohio, $350, a godsend. Michelle Vancouver, oh, thank you very much, $75 coming in there. Richard, Somerville, Massachusetts, I think I know you, thank you, $50. Jessica of San Diego, $25, it is all precious to us, it is all precious to this campaign, and we will work for those mice and rats and monkeys and cats and all the rest of the animals with this help it's it's really wonderful thank you so much um ben i I get back we have another live question yeah absolutely um lil from ashburn ashburn virginia has been waiting on the line lil are you there what's your question for kathy and jesse thank you very much yes i'm here um my question is about if peter is involved in any activities or any uh, anything that stops the unnecessary experiment that the high school kids do on the small animals, cats and other smaller animals, and if there is anything being done to stop this absolutely wasteful, terrible, terrible effect oh, on oh, you know, Lil, Lil, I've got your question. Thank you very, very much. I've got it. I'm just now racing as I'm being told that we have to conclude very quickly, and I don't want to miss your question. Let me give that to Kathy, if I may. Kathy, would you mind addressing that quickly? Yes, uh, just quickly. We're involved in high schools and classrooms all over the country. We've donated hundreds of uh, uh, software programs to high school classrooms to replace the use of animals in dissection. We just had a study published in the National Association of Biology Teachers showing that more students now than ever before have access and the right to use non-animal methods. And we've exposed some really awful abuse of animals in schools. You may have seen some of these videos online. And as a result of those, we have persuaded whole school districts, such as Miami-Dade in Florida, to end the use of animals. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, we've got time for one last question. Uh, Laurie from Yonkers, New York, says, it's wonderful hearing about so many PETA victories, and I want to help, but I'm not a scientist. Can you tell me what one person can do who doesn't necessarily have any influence? <laughs> Ingrid, I think that was your laugh in the background. Could you possibly tell Laurie from Yonkers what she can do? Oh, Laurie, you do have influence. You have far more influence than you can ever imagine. You're a consumer. And so you move the marketplace, which means, of course, that you can buy only cruelty-free products for your kitchen cabinet, your bathroom cabinet, cleaning your rug or your oven, whatever. But the important thing is to tell the people who you used to buy from why you're not buying from them. It's because they test and make sure they know they're losing your financial support in the marketplace. But the big thing is to pass on through social media, if you can, or in any way, all the work that you hear about. Let people know that the use of animals is bogus. It's yesterday. It needs to stop. There are alternatives, and they shouldn't stand for it. So from dissection in schools, for example, which, of course, there are alternatives to all of it, and we have wonderful models that we give to schools. We help them and so on. I mean, all the way through medical training, all the way to product testing, and all the way to the National Institutes of Health, is if you go to our website, you will find out which member of Congress that you need to lobby to stop funding uh, experiments like the military's use of animals in these training courses. We've already knocked out a whole bunch of that, and there's much more to knock out. So if you've got a Republican or a Democratic, a Democrat representative, we need you to contact them and we can tell you how to do it. So let us know. But yes, please just use social media, put up the flyers, talk to everybody, and let's whip this thing uh, into shape. Thank you so much, Laurie. And thank you, Ingrid. I think we might just be out of time at the moment. So um, do we have time for one more question, Ingrid? 
Um, we actually have two minutes left, so I'm not okay. at all sure we do. But I want to thank everybody who did submit questions, and, and I'm very sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, I also want to say thank you to Sam from Virginia Beach, $50, to Susan from New York, $100. And we've got just wonderful members lined up. Please press 7. If you haven't already, we need you, those animals who are watching the doorknob turn on the laboratory door and their blood pressure is going up, need you. So um, please help us with every way that you possibly can. Thank you for your support of our work. Can't do it without you. And I will wish you good night. Well, everybody, thank you for staying on the line. This concludes today's Pizza Town Hall. I do hope that you'll join us in January for our next meeting where we'll be discussing some of Peter's exciting plans to help animals in 2017. Thank you again and good evening.